Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on understanding your superannuation and disability entitlements. Your presenter today will be John Beryl and I'll be your facilitator and my name is Peter Butler. In the spirit of reconciliation, MS Limited acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. We also acknowledge our gratitude that we share this land today. We share our sorry, uh, sorry, our sorry for the cost of that sharing and our hope and belief that together we can shift to a place of equity, justice and partnership. So just an introduction to John. Uh, John Beryl is an insurance and superannuation lawyer with, lawyer with Beryl and Watson specialising in superannuation and insurance law. John has been delivering ex expert legal information for over 25 years, providing advice to people living with chronic illness and disability and disabilities on work entitlements, superannuation, DSP and various legal issues, including travel and car insurance and RTA rules. I'll hand you now over to John, um, who can start taking you through his webinar his presentation. Thanks very much, John. Morning, everybody. I'm John. Uh, I'm a solicitor. I practice in these areas we're talking about here. <clears throat> so I, I'm a superannuation lawyer. I'm an insurance lawyer. I, I'm also uh, know a lot about Centrelink stuff and also NDIS. So we're not going to get to all those topics today. Um, we're going to concentrate mainly on super and its interaction with Centrelink. Um, stuff about <coughs> Centrelink, diving into Centrelink stuff about DSPs and NDIS, that's for another day. Uh, but, you know, anytime you want to ask questions about them, I'm available. Give me a call anytime. So, look, um, we've only got an hour, so 45 minutes. So, um, <coughs> I've done these sessions now for over 20 years. Um, and the issues that come up <coughs> are all, all invariably the same sort of issues come up all the time right for people with ms ms is a condition that afflicts you during your working life and can affect your ability to work whether it's to to get work to stay in work or to exit work and what your entitlements are um and because ms is not uh normally associated with being a work-related condition your support benefits if you get to the point where you can't keep working whether that be short medium or long term are limited and they're limited basically to two type two buckets or three buckets i suppose one is any private insurance arrangements you've got two is any superannuation benefits you've got and the insurance that comes with that and three is government support mainly in the form of Centrelink benefits okay now all of these interact um and it's and it's look, it's got it's it's always been pretty complicated, but gee, it's got a lot more complicated in the last over the course and in the last five years, <clears throat> particularly the insurance arrangements, they've got more and more complicated. And it's 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 a bit of a it's a maze. And as there's a real pathway you've got to navigate if you're someone who is got a chronic illness like MS and <clears throat> and, want, <clears throat> and wants to keep working, or is looking at what your options are if you're considering cutting back on work or stopping work altogether, they're really you really do have to sort of navigate a pathway here to maximise what you might be able to get in what is a, a relatively limited field because it's not a compo-related condition. All right, so um, I'll put together some basic slides about the issues that are related to what superannuation people have through employment super, what the insurance arrangements are, when you can get early access to your superannuation, uh, when you, if you stop work, what the disability insurance and death insurance benefits can be, um, how you how you make claims for them, the rights of appeal against decisions that are made, and then importantly, what the interaction with that can be with Centrelink on the income and assets test, and what Centrelink benefits you might be able to get, in particular. The disability support pension. So I've prepared some slides on that stuff. I'm not going to go through them all because we'll be here for more than the hour and I really want to, this to be as interactive as possible, difficult as it's on the screen, 
but the way to do it, as Pete said, is type in any questions you've got and we'll go through them as we go. So what I'll do is I'll pick out a couple of little areas, a couple of little topics, um, but please <clears throat> type in your questions. Peter will interrupt me, ask me the questions, <clears throat> and we'll make it as interactive as possible. Because I think the questions any one of you have got will be relevant to the others as well, okay? So um, let's just start with what super do do people have and what 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 are the insurance men? What should you look for? So basically, if you're in the employed workforce, you'll be covered by superannuation in Australia. Um, it's been in place now for, gee, it's 30 years. Yeah, I started doing this in 93. Um, it is 30 years now that super has been in play in Australia. And that's why the superannuation industry is so big. Although in the last year, it's gone south a bit, the value of it, just a bit. <clears throat> um, so uh, over the course of that time, most people have sort of accumulated significant super or depending on where you are in the in the in the work in your work life. Um, the idea is that if you start as a 20 year old work or 18 year old working, by the time you get to retirement age, whether that's 65, 70, 50, 60, whatever, you'll have enough to live up in your retirement for the rest of your life. That's the theory about around it all. But a crucial part of it is that um, <clears throat> we have the uh, it, this, the industry um, mainly via these old government defined benefit schemes builds in the permutations and combinations if your working life is cut short because you pass away or importantly if you become disabled and you can't keep working. So if, if that's the scenario you won't have enough to live off in retirement because you won't have accumulated enough super all the way through from go to work. So what the idea of these insurance benefits that are put in place in super is to top up the super that you've accumulated to give you something like an adequate retirement income to live off in your retirement if it if, if your working life is cut short. That's the theory around it all. And that's what these that's why insurance is in super in Australia. Australia is actually very unique um, with this. You know, a lot of countries have got various superannuational pension schemes in place. Um, but only a handful have got this sort of insurance um, safety net a scenario in place. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so what we have here is um, in Australia is that you've got these benefits in place. And if your working life is cut short because of MS or because of any other chronic illness, for example, or if it's or if you have fractured work patterns because you have an attack or you become sick and you have to stop work for a short or medium period of time before you get back before you get better and you go back into the workforce then these benefits can come into play and they are really 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 important for people with chronic illnesses much more so than for the general population <clears throat> who who the expectation would be they will work until retirement age you know hopefully your working life will you'll be able to have live a full working life right but if it is that it's cut short, this stuff is definitely in play for you. And it's really important to look at it and focus on it while you're working and make plans around this stuff before you get to the point of stopping work. If you have already stopped work, then it's a case of looking back to see what was in play when you worked and in particular when you stopped work. And that's where things get so complicated because these insurance arrangements in super, they vary, they're all over the place, right? There are thousands of super funds out there, although the number is contracting all the time. Um, <clears throat> and the, of the, those super funds have different insurance rates. There's no one, one size fits all on these things. Every super fund's got different arrangements, right? So some of the old government defined benefit schemes like PSS and CSS and the old ESSS, that's the Victorian government one and the Commonwealth government one, they have very generous pension schemes that pay you a, a lifetime, potentially a lifetime pension if you become unfit for work in the longer term. Uh, whereas the, uh, what we call the industry funds, for example, the C, you know, the ads on TV, the C buses, the Australian Supers, the Host Pluses, the Hesters, the Aware Super, you know, all those ads on TV, they're industry, they're industry funds and they have insurance arrangements attached to them that cover you potentially lump sums for 
what if you are permanent or long-term unfit for work called TPD or total and permanent disability or monthly payments if you're short-term unfit for work or temporarily unfit for work whether that's be whether that's for six months a year two years or maybe even maybe even longer right but this stuff is really important right so it's really important you know about it it's really important you look for what's there it's really important that you plan ahead for for it if you are still working but if you're out of the workforce already you've got to go back and look and see what was in play at the relevant time and that's where i can i can help you with all that stuff okay um how are we going p we got any questions yet come on people let me uh, have it no questions no questions as of yet. I'll let you know if one comes in. Right. Okay. Well, the let's just quickly talk about the the, the disability benefits, right? So there's there's two type two main types. One is total and permanent disability. So Pete, go to the slide that had disability benefits. I think it's about the fourth one. Not that one. The next one. That one. So TPD is a is a phrase that's used a lot. Those of us who work in the industry know what it is, but it means total and permanent disability which means you're long-term unfit for work so if your ms gets to the point where you can't keep working and that looks like it's going to be long term <coughs> then you can be eligible for not only the account balance the money that's in the fund accumulated in the fund by you by your contributions and your employer's contributions and whatever is earned but also insurance this insurance benefit to top it up to provide you with this sort of extra dough to cover you for, for your retirement, right? So the industry type funds like Aware Super, CBUS, um, Australian Super, they host plus rest, they provide a lump, most of them provide a lump sum for total and permanent disability. If you if you can't do your normal job or any other suitable work uh, with your education, with your skills and experience in the long term, then you are a potential candidate for not only the money in your fund, but also this insurance benefit. Um, and if you if you are if you prove that you are totally and permanently disabled, you're entitled to get paid out all the dough straight away. You don't have to wait until you get to retirement age, which for most of you will be age at least age 60. You have to you can get all the money out now. You can take some of it out. You can roll it over and keep it in a super fund. You can take some of it out. You can take all of it out, whichever you like, right? Um, so or just about all super funds just about all not all but just about all super funds have a, a have a, a, a have an insurance benefit that is a has a tpd lump sum the main exception to it is hester right which is sort of the private health industry that has that does not have a tpd lump sum or not as a not as the automatic option you can opt to take it out but very few people do but the vast majority of other funds do have an insurance lump sum for total and permanent disability right um uh, the other main type of benefit is what they call income protection or temporary disability benefits. That's a different type of benefit. It pays you a monthly benefit, pays your monthly income replacement benefit. It can go for two years, it can go for five years, it can go to age 65, or in the case of Hester, it can go for even longer, right? Um, so, and the amount it pays you is usually either a set month, uh, is a, usually a, a percentage of your salary when you stop work, but capped out at a monthly benefit. So for example, with Australian Super, the capped out rate is, the default capped out rate is three grand a month. It's 75% of your salary up to three grand a month. <laughs> with rest, it's, <coughs> pardon me, about two and a half grand a month, but it's 75% it's of your salary plus the super guarantee, the compulsory super contribution. Um, with Aware Super, it's again, it's a monthly benefit up to 75% of your salary up to, it's a, that's a modest amount, up to a thousand bucks a month. It varies, it's all over the place, right? About half super funds have got the monthly, the income protection benefit. Just about all of them have got the TPD lump sum, but around about half of them have got the monthly benefit as well, right? And then as I say, in the case of Hester, it's, default benefit or its standard benefit is only the monthly payment and it's about a thousand bucks a month payable to age 67 all right uh, then there are other benefits in super which is the death a death insurance benefit which is if you die if you if you die before retirement age uh, then <coughs> there is an insurance lump sum paid to your estate or to your dependents 
as well as the account balance. Or if you've got a terminal illness, which means less than two years to live, you've also got this insurance lump sum that can be paid to you in within if within that you know two year period before you pass away or you projected to pass away. Um, so that's sort of the range of insurance benefits in super. Um, uh, the question then is, well, when am I going to be eligible for this stuff, right? So the the majority of you, I suspect, in all the talks I've given, the majority of people are still working, right? They might be newly diagnosed, they might be recently diagnosed, or they might be somewhere along the along the spectrum and they're still working, but maybe struggling to work a bit or considering taking some time out from work, whether it be you know one month, two months, six months out of work, or reducing their hours of work, right? So the question is, okay, well, what, what are these benefits are in play if I want to keep working? And the answer is, if you keep working, then none of the benefits are in play while you're still working, right? They are in play potentially when you stop work, right? But if you stop work, <clears throat> If you stop work for the long term, then both the TPD lump sum and the monthly income protection benefits are in play, plus the account balance. But if, you, if you're going to be stopping work only for a limited period of time, taking a few months out, then maybe the income protection benefits in play. The TPD lump sum won't be in play at that time. The difficulty with MS though is that with MS, the symptoms are up and down. It's a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, so you may have periods of time where your fatigue gets the better of you, for example, and you have to stop work. You have to take time out from work, right? But then your health improves and you then go back to work. Well, that, that's a, so a TPD benefit, TPD insurance benefits probably not in play at that stage, but the monthly income protection payments may be to, to, to give you some income support for the time that you're off work, right? So you'd use up, for example, if you were consider if you if you know you're really battling with fatigue, you think I've, I've just got to take some time out here. Um, so you'd use up your sick leave, although and you know for a lot of you, you all you would already have done that. So then this income protection stuff comes into play. The problem, one of the problems with the income protection is that there is a waiting period during which you don't get paid, right? So most of them have a waiting period of either 30, 60, or 90 days. So for that period of time. They don't pay you the insurance. At the end of that period, if the claim is accepted, they do pay you. They will backdate your payments to that 30 day, 60 day, 90 day start. And then those benefits are payable to you whilst you're unfit to do your normal job, right? So for the monthly income protection, you just got to be unfit to do your normal job for the time being. But with a TPD, that's for if you are long-term unfit for work. And then the bar, so the bar set a lot higher with that, right? Now these are insurance benefits provided by insurance companies. So, you know, you've got to make claims with insurance companies. We all have this, you know, there's that old adage that insurers will take your take your premiums, but when it comes to paying the claim, that's a different ball game. And that's true, right? But uh, nevertheless, if you have MS, uh, and if you have a chronic illness like MS and you get to the point where you are considering stopping work, whether it be short, medium or long-term, all these benefits are in place. So don't be put off by the idea of, oh, no insurance company will ever pay. You know, that's not true. I've run thousands of claims, literally thousands of claims for people. Well, I reckon at least a thousand claims for people with MS. And they all both all these benefits are doable. When and if you make the health and lifestyle decision to stop work, whether it be short, medium, or long term, right? But as I say, if you haven't yet stopped work, it's really important not to just wait until that time but to have a look at this stuff and sort of plan ahead do some planning ahead right so the statements you get from super fund they come out every every year um at least every year where are we now we're in july the reporting period usually is around about august september when the when the super fund send out same as well they used to send them out by snail mail but that don't happen no more it's usually done by electronically so you and and at any stage you can usually log on use to the super fund and check your account balance and get an up-to-date statement if you want to right at any point in time but the general reporting period is at least around about september october november okay so if not before so i would encourage you to have a look and see what's there but then when you do then speak to someone about it get advice about what your situation is right about where you are on the spectrum of working 
and or considering stopping work or already stop work and look at what you've got and consider these sorts of benefits because they're all in play right they're, they're potentially in play for you and if you are and as I say you fit the bill you fit this like a glove um, what these benefits are designed to do really does fit like a glove with MS which is a, a condition that can affect people's ability to work during their working lives right so this stuff is this stuff is in play it's important right so now there are a couple of tricks to all of this or a couple of tips to look out for if you are working or if you are considering changing jobs or reducing your hours or stopping work you need to check this stuff out first right because what the decisions you make can affect your the what you're covered for and your ability to claim so an, an example prime example of that is if you're working full time but it's smashing you and you're considering going back to part time so reducing from 35 hours a week to three day, five days a week to three days a week for example right um uh, <clears throat> can you do that yes you can but it could affect particularly the income protection benefit right because that's calculated under most funds is calculated as a percentage of your salary when you stop work so if your salary if you reduce your hours before you get to the point of stopping work your salary can go from five days a week salary to three days a week salary and therefore the percentage they pay you when you stop work for the income protection is less right it still might be above the monthly cap under the policy but it may not right and it might mean that uh, if you reduce before you if you make a decision to reduce your hours and then later on stop work you it may, could mean that the income protection benefit is less than it otherwise would be right so I'm not saying in that well therefore don't ever reduce your hours um, because of that but um, what I'm saying to you is you need to look at this you need to map this out you need to understand what's there you need to understand what the implications of all this are and then make an informed decision about what you want to do whether it be to continue working at the hours you are whether it's try and make modifications at work and stay with the working hours or whether it's reduce your hours or whether it's just pull the plug and stop work altogether right this is an important part of that equation to steer the path right particularly for the income protection reduction of hours doesn't usually affect the tpd lump sum um, that but that can be affected by decisions you make about why you stop work right so if you stop work um, uh, because you just don't want to work anymore or, or you want to change jobs for example uh, or you know start up your own business um, it can mean that uh, you might lose the TPD insurance cover from when you stop work with that uh, contributing super fund. It might not, you might still be able to keep the cover going, but it, you may not. And there are these rules that have been introduced in the last three or four years around what happens to insurance in super when your account falls below a certain amount or where uh, there's no contributions going into the fund i dare say some of you would have seen in the last year or well, it was, was in the last two two or three years probably it was actually basically pre-covid right immediately before COVID hit there were all these rules which are introduced to consolidate inactive super funds accounts and also to to stop insurance cover under funds when no monies were going into the fund after about 18 months right you would have got all these if you might remember this was a couple of years ago now there were these notices sent out to people saying you've got a super fund that's had no contributions going in for 18 months unless you tell us you want to continue the cover we're going to cut it off and that was first of april 2020 was the last time that happened was when that last happened um so um you it, it, but so the cover can be cut off and if you are not unfit for work then but you later on become unfit for work because of your ms you can miss out on this very valuable insurance which can be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and can be a significant component of you know what you what you can be living off in your retirement as uh, if, if nothing else the message i'm trying to get out to you is have a look at this stuff right if you are working if you're in the workforce and you are dealing with your ms have a look at this stuff see what you've got there get advice from it 
uh, get advice about it to see where you're up, where you are up to, what your rights are, what you should keep going, what you shouldn't, right? All important stuff. Sorry, I'm banging on about that. Um, um, <clears throat> so you, that's that. Yeah. Do you want to get to a few questions now, John? Yeah, yeah. All right, Pete. Great. Um, I'll just let everyone know that I'll stop showing the slides um, and we'll just have um, John as he answers some questions. Um, so I'll stop showing the screen now. Um, so first question we have here is, I have uh, REST superannuation or REST, uh, Retail yep. Employees Superation, Superannuation Trust and yep. Industry Super Fund. However, I now work in healthcare for the last eight years. Does this yep. matter? No, is the answer. So if <clears throat> the way it used to be was these industry funds, you know the ads on TV, your super, that, those ones, um, they were superannuation funds that were set up for particular industries. So REST is for the re retail, the so shoppies, so people who work in retail, okay? Host Plus is for people who work in hospitality. CBUS is for people who work in construction. Lucruf was for people who work Storman and Packers, right? So they were, they used to be very industry specific the funds and if you left the industry then you couldn't remain a member of the fund and you had to go to a different fund with a different employer but now nowadays that isn't the case and what usually happens is that your super follows you to whatever fund whatever industry you move to you can opt to change that insurance when you move to a different employer you'll be given a you'll be given a form a, a choice form to be able to pick the fund you want to. So if you say to them, the default fund under the choice form will be the fund you've already got. So in this person's case, it will be rest. But the person, if they're in now in um, uh, health, the health industry, wasn't it? Um, they could opt for a different fund. They could opt for a fund like Aware. Aware Super covers, the, traditionally covers people who work in the health, public health industry. Private health industry is HESTA. Uh, or you could pick a different fund, right? So you had the option of doing that, but that most people don't do that. Most people just stick with the fund they've got. And that means that the fund, in this person's case, the, <clears throat> the rest cover can continue or the rest super continues and the insurance under it continues uh, in the new job, right? <clears throat> next. Perfect, thank you. Um, so next question, I have nearly used all my income protection insurance. I have some yep. ESSS and some private superannuation. I've not been allowed to work since 2017. I'm lost and confused. Right, okay. Well, don't despair. We can sort that out for you. Okay, so you're on income protection. Um, uh, I mean, difficult with this is we can't be sort of interactive. So most income protection policies pay you for two years, right? At the end of the two year period, the payments stop. Under most funds, if you're also covered for a TPD lump sum that we talked about before, <clears throat> you can potentially claim that as well, right? You could have claimed that from the get-go, but now if the income protection is nearly up, you can apply, You if, the, if you're covered for TPD, you can look at making a claim for that. If you, what this person's talking about is that they also had a couple of other funds uh, kicking around. So ESSS is the state government uh, scheme so for state government employees <clears throat> it used to be for uh, emergency services like police ambos um, etc uh, but it's uh, but it's now but, it, it, but it's broader for all public servants now depending on uh, depending on whether when you joined it but if this person was a member of ESSS um, from old government employment pre 1994 then they would be in each of then they'd be in the old one of the old defined benefit schemes. But if they've left the industry, left the government employment, then the ESSS scheme benefits sit there. But depending on which one you've got, you may be able to claim uh, an invalidity pension under that superannuation scheme. And it's worth having a look at to see what's there because if you can claim an invalidity pension at the end of your income protection period. That might be a, uh, that might at least partially substitute for the for the stopping of the income protection, as well as possibly any TPD lump sums the person's got. Right, so it's worth having a look at. 
contact me afterwards, I'll have a look at it for you. It doesn't cost you anything for me to do that. I'm happy to help you. Next. Thank you. Um, I have TPD through my super and also TPD through additional personal insurance. Does one yep. limit the other or sh should I need to make a claim? No. Most the there it's extremely rare for there to be an offset clause for TPD lump sums, right? The vast majority of them you can claim both, right? That's not the case for the monthly payment ones, right? The monthly payment ones are often offset, but the TPD lump sums you can have as many as you like. And it's great that you've got it, that you've got the private TPD and you've got it through your employment super. Um, if you're at the point, if you're reaching the point of stopping work or considering stopping work, or if you've already done it and you want to look at making claims, it's worthwhile to make claims under both, right? But it is important to just get a check to make sure <coughs> that the, there is no offset, first of all, almost certainly there won't be. And secondly, if there's a potential timing issue, because sometimes it's under some super funds, depending on the wording, it's worthwhile to make a claim for one before you make the other. Under most of them, you can make both claims at once, but with a, in some scenarios, it's, it, it, the timing is important. Again, send a, let me have a look at it and I'll tell you and we'll work it out, all right? Next. Um, so this is sort of two separate questions and hopefully this makes sense to you, but it, BT super for life, and does this have TPD? Yep. The vast BT BT Super is a re, is a retail fund. <clears throat> BT is sort of a, um, a a branch of or sub branch of the Westpac. Um, so, uh, but BT is a retail fund. Uh, <clears throat> if you <clears throat> if Employment Super was paid into it, almost certainly it would have had insurance cover for death and TPD, maybe income protection as well when you were working. I, I don't know if this person's still working. If they are, then it almost certainly does have it. Um, but if it's a re, if it's a private fi, private superannuation taken out um, and you're self-employed, for example, it may not. But let's have a look at it to see what's there, right? But if you are if you're working and in the employer is contributing to it, then the answer is almost certainly it does. But worth but again, as part of this sort of idea of mapping out what the future holds for you and which way to go and all that. Let's have a look at it, all right? Next, please. Any more? Um, so, um, hi, John, my super is with Hester. Should I yep. be rolling my super over to another fund? Um, okay, so it depends on whether you're still working, right? If you are still working and your employer is contributing to Hester, um, then as I say, Hester's got their default insurance arrangements or their standard insurance arrangements don't include the TPD lump sum, right? It's it's an historical thing. Um, uh, I could bang on it about it for ages, but well, basically what it used to be, that Hester used to cover the AIDS councils. And back in the 90s when the AIDS crisis hit, um, Hester, through their insurance arrangements, were absolutely inundated with AIDS-related TPD claims. And what, ha what happened was that their claims experience um, blew out and the insurance in and the insurance co or the, there were two insurance companies at the time who covered them one after another they they withdrew from the market for Hester because their claims experience was so adverse and they were losing money on it right so Hester way back when the only insurance they could get was a monthly benefit not a TPD lump sum right and that's and that's been in place since 1996. That, that Hester has had as their default option, no TPD cover, only the monthly income protection payment. It's about a thousand bucks, about a thousand fifty bucks a month. <coughs> there are there is a small component of a lump sum in Hester's default arrangements, but it's only small. But for there is no TPD cover, which is very, which is very, which is a problematic, right? So it's not great. It's not the best insurance cover kicking around. The only advantage of Hester is that it actually pays your monthly payments to age 67 is the default cover under Hester. But it's also got offsets for Centrelink. And I'll talk about that at the end if we get time. It's in the um, uh, pro forma stuff I've, you've got. Um, <clears throat> but Hester's, Hester's problematic. So the question is, okay, if, if my Hester's pretty lousy, my insurance is pretty lousy, should I change insurers? 
The problem with doing that, should I change super funds and therefore change the insurance arrangement? The problem with that is if you're with one employer and you opt and you've been with that employer for more than six months, if you change super funds and therefore try and change insurance, most of the insurance arrangements, they're, they're under, these, under super, they give you the cover automatically. They don't ask you health questions, but if you are doing it, if you've been with an employer for more than six months and you change from one fund to another, that that's a red flag to most super funds. So that raises this sort of underwriting red flag. So what they do is they say, well, if you're changing to us from an, but without changing employers, if you're staying with the same employer uh, more than six months later, then we will. Uh, we won't give you automatic cover, we'll only give you cover with health questionnaires. And if you've already got MS, then that's going to be a problem. So I think the answer is probably no for this person. You've, you've probably got to stay with what you've got unless you change employers. If you change employers, you will have the option under that choice form I talked about before to take out different insurance, right? To, ta to put in money into a different super fund that's got different insurance. And you should look at that. So but if you're still planning to stay with a one employer, you're probably going to have to stay with Hester, right? As far as the insurance arrangements go. But again, let me have a look at it I'll, to make sure that that's what, you, what you've got to do, okay? Next, any more? Uh, yep, got a few more. Uh, is it too late to apply for income protection and the like if I was not covered for this before? I was of the impression insurers won't, won't, won't know you have MS. Okay, two type, two ways, to, two main ways to get insurance, right? So income protection, TPD, uh, either privately or through group arrangements. Privately, if which is you know you approach, uh, well, you, you know, an AMP or a TAL or a One Path, uh, you will get as part of that a health questionnaire, right? And if you're applying for income protection yourself, then they'll ask you a whole bunch of questions, one of which will be almost certainly, do you have MS? And if you tick the box saying, yes, you've got MS, then they won't cover you for income protection. They almost certainly won't cover you for TPD. The only real avenue you've got of getting this cover is through superannuation, through employment super, right? And that's because if you're joining up with an employer, you're joining up with a whole group of people, you join a super fund that is a massive fund, right? So, you know, Australian Super, for instance, has got two and a half million members REST has got over 2 million members, right? So if you join an employer, if you start a job with an employer and you, you take out um, the super as part of that, they will give you the cover on, a def on an automatic basis without asking you any health questions because they can spread the risk across the 2.5 million members, right? So that's the means by which you can get it. But if you're already in employment or if you're self-employed, then no. You, you almost certainly won't be able to get in uh, income protection or TPD cover because you've got MS. But again, it depends on what your circumstances are. Is this person already off, unable to work or are they self-employed? Because if you are self-employed, there are some possibilities. So for example, if you're self-employed, you could set up a corporate structure, you could set up a company, employ yourself as part of a company and then take out super, and then you, the employer, has to pay super for you, the employee, you can join a super fund, you can get default insurance cover that way, okay? There are ways and means. Again, let's have a look at it. Next, Pete. Um, my diagnosis came after the super account was started. Is it worth increasing cover or will it be impossible to achieve post-diagnosis? Yep, with most super funds, you get the default cover. You get the sort of automatic cover when you join, right? Um, you can tick a box saying, I want extra cover. Usually it comes in units. So, you know, you get multiples of the cover you've got. <clears throat> if you don't do that at the start, uh, if you do apply for extra cover, you usually are subject to health questioning, right? So underwriting. So they ask you health questions. They might not ask you the full range of questions, but they will ask you questions. And if you've already got, if you take out the cover, get the default arrangements, then you get MS then you want to apply to increase the cover, almost certainly you'll get caught out, you know, under these underwriting rules. So the answer is no. If you change, however, as we talked about before, if you change jobs, right, I'm not saying you should, but if you do change jobs, just keep in mind that you'll get another choice form, you can pick a different super fund, 
you could take out insurance cover with that, you can keep the insurance cover with the existing fund going, and you can have two lots running at the one time, right? Ways and means, all legitimate. Next. Um, is a re reversionary nomination the same as binding nomination? Um, so, uh, <coughs> let's talk about, this is the, um, one of the screens you'll get is a, deals with death benefits, or a couple of them deal with death benefits. So the way superannuation works is that when you take out super, one of the one of the form one of the things I ask you is well, who gets the dough if you die? Um, you can nominate someone to get your money, or nominate one or more people. There are two different types of nominations. One's called non-binding, and the other is called binding. Right? A non-binding nomination is, as it says, you can nominate someone. The trustee of the super fund, if you die, makes the they will look at what you've done. That's the one. They'll look at what you've done, but they will decide who gets the money. They'll look for any dependents of yours at the date of death, um, uh, and they will they will make a decision who gets what amongst those dependents, or whether it goes to the estate. If you have a binding nomination and you and you nominate someone who they must be a dependent, so your spouse, de facto children, financial dependents, then the money goes to that person all persons, or if you nominate your estate, it goes to the estate in, and then it goes as per your will, right? So you can take out, <coughs> if, you, if you're in a super fund that's got binding nominations and you want, and you want the certainty of who gets the money, then um, log on, fill in your binding nomination form. It's, it, it's done in the same way as a will. It's got to be witnessed and that sort of stuff in the same way as a will has to. But the important thing is that the nominees must be dependents of yours at the time of the nomination and also remain dependents at the time of your death. All right. So if you want to do that, check what you've got. Again, any questions, let me know. Now, but that's different to a reversionary pension, right? Now, what the, what the questioner is asking is, if you've got a reversionary pension, most of these, the government schemes I talked about before, which is the their government schemes like uh, PSS, CSS, ESSS, <clears throat> they are um, they're what we call the old government defined benefit schemes. And under those schemes, um, if you become disabled, uh, then or if you <clears throat> or if you die, uh, if you become disabled, you get a, you're entitled to a pension. Or if you get to retirement age you're entitled to a pension until you die. If you then die, then what they call a reversionary pension is payable to your, usually limited to, it depends on the fund, or the wording in the fund, which is usually under an act of parliament, usually payable to your surviving spouse or children up to a certain age, but usually just surviving spouse, they get a reversionary pension, which means it's about, of usually about two thirds of your pension. So if you're on an, say an ESSS, say if you're a state government employee, you've retired, you're on an ESSS pension, whether it's a retirement pension or an invalidity pension, if you pass away, the, uh, a reversionary pension, so a proportion of that pension, usually about two thirds, gets paid to your surviving spouse or de facto, uh, or children usually up to a certain age, maybe 21, uh, if, they're, or st if they're students, they get a pension for their life, right? Um, that's the way reversionary pensions work. Some funds require you to nominate those people. Most of them don't. It's just a question of who is your surviving um, spouse or children. I hope that answers the question. So just on that, um, can you make a binding nomination if you don't have any dependents? Uh, is the only yeah. way to do this via a will. Correct. You can do. It, you can nominate your estate. So, say for example, <clears throat> even if you've got dependents, if you want money to go to a non-dependent, say you wanted to go to a charity, say you wanted to go to the MS Society or to the Lost Dogs Home or something like that. If you want money to go to them, you have to not. You can't do it directly under a binding nomination. You can't say that person or that entity. You have to say, as per my will, and in your will, you nominate that mob to get the money. Okay? That's how you do it. Cool. Thank you. Um, so uh, this, this is now unrelated to the topic, but I stopped work 12 months ago and have co-contributed some money to my super. Is it too late to claim TPD with Catholic super? 
Yes. Uh, I, I got. Um, I, I understand. Sorry, can you? What's the question there? Um, I can ask it again. Um, I stopped work twelve months ago and have co-contributed some money to my super. Is it too late to claim TPD with Catholic super? No, no, not at all. No, this. If you stop, you don't have to make a claim for these benefits before you stop work. In fact, you can't. And you don't have to make the claim within a particular time frame after you stop work. I mean, I, I, I've lodged claims for people who stopped work 20 years ago, right? Um, there's no, there's usually, usually, no time limit to lodge a claim for a TPD benefit. So if you stop work, if you've, if you've been out of the workforce, whether it's because of MS or anything else, um, and you can show that as from when you stop work, you are unfit for work, right? Then you can go back and make claims. You know, years ago, one year ago, two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. It's these things are doable, right? It the longer the period of time, the harder it is, but it's not impossible, and you should certainly look at it. And so, if in this person, the, the questioner's case, he or she st <coughs> stopped work, presumably worked in the Catholic education system, stopped work 12 months ago, um, they can make they can look at making a TPD claim. Catholic Super also includes a TPD lump sum and monthly income protection payments for three years. Um, so that both of those claims should be looked at. Okay. The next one, I have contacted ANZ Super and they advise that they no longer use the term non-binding, but now have non-lapsing. What does this uh, mean and what are the implications? <laughs> Do I have to have this renewed? Yeah. Um, this is a really vexed subject. Um, there are some super funds who have taken the view that um, um, all the administration around binding nominations is a pain in the bum and they're trying to avoid it. You see, what the rules say is when the government was, it was 15 years ago now that binding nominations were introduced, the rules around it are <coughs> the person nomina you nominate must be a dependent. You must fill in a form. It must be signed by someone who is witnessed, and that form then goes into the super fund. The super fund records it, and that nomination is in place for three years. <clears throat> At the end of that three years, it lapses, and you've got to go through the process all over again. So you've got to keep renominating for the binding nomination every three years. You can, under the rules, um, uh, change your nomination at least every 12 months. So that required super funds to have this administration in process to notify people of who their binding nominees were every year, give them the opportunity to change that every year, at least every year, and at the end of every three years, say to them, okay, your nomination now lapses, do you want to do it again? Put in a new form and then start it all over again. So that system was put in place it was put in place to give people some certainty around who gets their dough, um, but also to um, <coughs> take account of the fact that because superannuation is a long-term investment vehicle, people's situations can change. So they wanted to make sure that every, at least every three years, you have a look at it to see that your situation hasn't changed, right? That was, that was the policy setting behind it all, which was very sound policy setting. But some super funds thought, oh God, this is a pain in the bum. It's just, there's so much administration around this. So what some smart ass came up with this idea that, oh, we'll, we'll change the rules of the fund and introduce what they call non-lapsing, which means that it doesn't lapse every three years. And because of a quirk in the way the law works, the argument is that is not illegal. That complies with the superannuation obligations. You can have a binding nomination, but it's non-lapsing. So once you make it, you can't lapse it. <laughs> um, <coughs> and um, uh, but what you can do is uh, there are ways and means around it. One of which is leave the fund and go to a different fund uh, and look at the look at the circumstances of the nomination, etc. So again, if you, if the person wants to consider changing it, if they've got it on, if they've already made the nomination. And their and the, the circumstances have changed. Some funds, some of the non-lapsing ones, have do allow for changes if 
person's had a change of life. So for example, if they've had a divorce, uh, if they've had a death in the family, if they've had a child, <clears throat> in those circumstances, some funds allow for the non-lapsing things to change. But if you if this person's already got a non-lapsing in place and they they want to consider changing it, let me know and we'll have a look at it and see the way work out the way around it. Okay? This stuff gets complicated, eh? Nothing's it's nothing straightforward. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, another question here. <laughs> um, hi John, still working part time, covered with or for TBD with Mercer since 2001. Recently yep. reduced hours slightly and work four days a week. I want yep. to stop working in the next two years and focus on health and life. I'm 55 year old with years old with MS since 2003. How yep. disabled do I have to be? Okay. Um, good question. So that's sort of what we were talking about before, right? Which is um, Mercer. Mercer is a retail fund. <clears throat> the insurance cover under a lot of the retail funds is usually pretty good. One thing about insurance in super is that under a lot of funds, not all, but a lot of funds, as you get close to retirement age, the insurance starts to slide away, right? It starts to reduce. So this person's been a member of MRSA for 20 years. So their insurance cover, it does change because the arrangements often change every three years or can change every three years. But... Um, the, the chances are that the amount of the cover that for TPD this person has got is is starting to slide, right? Um, uh, if that they've reduced their hours from full time to five day, to four days a week, um, that's what I said before about the income protection. It won't affect the TPD cover usually, but it will probably affect any income protection the person has if they've got it, right? So I need to check that to see. Um, but if, if depending on what your wage is, if the monthly payment for income protection is capped out at say three or four grand a month, it may not affect it significantly if at all. But what they're talking about is, look, I've got MS, uh, it's, um, you know, it's affecting me, my health and lifestyle. I'm gonna, I'm looking at making a health and lifestyle decision to stop work. That's, that's sort of the third stage that we see from people. You know, we see people who are diagnosed and working then people who are working but struggling a bit to work and then people who are sort of considering the health and lifestyle decision to stop work. This person is looking at, is sort of in that between stages two and three, right? Really important they look at this. But basically, <clears throat> my advice to them is when and if you get make the health and lifestyle decision to stop work, you are in the ball game of a TPD lump sum. You are certainly in the ball game of an income protection benefit if you've got it, but you're also in the ball game of a TPD. But it's really important to look at what you've got, to sort of map it out, to stay in touch with your doctors, in particular your neuro. Now, most most neuro MS neuros are terrific and supportive, and you know, for particular <laughs> particular people who are long termers, they'll very often say to them, "Listen, what the hell are you still doing working? You know, you need to look after yourself. You need to look after your health." Uh, I'll support you if you if you get to the if you reach the point of stopping work, right? Not always, but most of them are like that, right? So, what, the person needs to check the super um, now and then sort of put in place stuff so that when and when the, when and if they pull the trigger to stop work, they know what they know what they can potentially claim. But but the, the, to be the TPD lump sum is probably if you are on the balance of probabilities permanently un unfit for work for at least six months usually and then uh, on the balance of the evidence permanently unfit to do the normal job or any other suitable work with their skills and experience the permanency question is usually the thing right because with ms symptoms are a bit like this so it's a question of hitting at the right point of the of the roller coaster as to when you've got to the point of being unfit for work but as i say i've run probably a thousand TPD claims for people with MS and the strike rate is very high. So when you get to that point of making the health and lifestyle decision, you are definitely in the ball game, right? So, but it's really important to, to check what you've got now and to keep that in play until the, you reach the point of making this decision to stop work, okay? Any more? Um, we've got a couple more, but I was just, uh, just a bit <laughs> conscious right. of time and were you wanting to go through the Centrelink DSP impairment tables? Uh, I, I, I thought we'd run out of time. Uh, all right, so look really quickly. So the super stuff is really important, right? 
Um, but <clears throat> when and if you make the decision to stop work, um, uh, if you're not eligible for income protection payments, or even if you are, you might be eligible for Centrelink benefits, right? Now, the basic Centrelink benefit is called Job Seeker. Uh, you're not going to get rich on that. It pays you th basic 300 bucks a week, right? It, but there is a higher benefit, which is the disability support pension, which is about 450 bucks a week as a base amount um, with add-ons, etc. But to be eligible for the DSP, you got to jump a few hurdles. Um, now, uh, and one of the, the most significant hurdles is this impairment table. So we, the eligibility criteria for the DSP are you've got to be, you've got to be you've got to have a condition that's been diagnosed, fully treated and stabilised. That can be a problem with MS because, you know, you can be under active treatment, your condition may not be stable because it might be fluctuating. And for some people, a diagnosis of MS takes quite some time, right? So that's a that's an issue. The second thing is you've got to have an impairment uh, on, the, on one of these impairment, one or more impairment tables of 20 points. And what's listed there, what Peter's put up there, and it's in the stuff you've got, is the tables. There are 15 tables that, um, <laughs> impairment tables, the ones that are, that cover all sorts of impairments, you know, impairments for doing day-to-day -day activities. It's a measuring data, it, it, it's about health, health issues, and it measures your ability to do day-to-day -day activities and, and, uh, and categorises it either mild, moderate, or severe. You've got to get 20 points to be eligible for the DSP, whether that's under one table or more than one table combined. The ones, the tables there that are relevant to MS are table one, that's fatigue, covers fatigue. Table, tables two and table two, which covers lower limb function. Table five, potentially if you've got you know mental health issues arising from your MS, and table seven, which is brain function if you've got cognitive issues, right? They are the, they're the ones that generally speaking, MS is relevant to. And if you've got, depending on the level of your impairment, which is your ability to do day-to-day -day activities like cleaning, um, shopping, uh, catching public transport, working, interacting with other people, that sort of stuff, you'll get classified as mild, moderate or severe, <clears throat> or not at all. Um, and if you hit 20 points under one of them, you'll be eligible for the DSP if your condition's stabilised, right? And the, the significance of that is the DSP pays 50% more than the, about 50% more than the um, uh, job seeker rate does, and it's not subject to the, you know, looking for 20 jobs a month thing that um, job seeker is. <clears throat> but so how that interacts then with, with the superannuation you get paid out is important. So Pete, if we go down to, one of the last tables, the last two tables, which cover, not that one, not that one, that one, the income test. This, there's the Centrelink income test and the Centrelink assets test, under which you look at eligibility for the DSP or, or job seeker um, <clears throat> is also limited potentially by the income test and the assets test, right? The income test covers things like income protection payments, right? And basically, it's not quite right, but the general rule is um, 50 cents in the dollar. Basically, for every 50 cents you get from income protection, it reduces the uh, the uh, your, your settling benefit by 50 cents in the dollar. Right? Then there's the next one, the assets test. That one there, it's but there are depending on whether you're a homeowner or a non-homeowner, the current rate for just wrote it. I looked it up this morning for assets. If you're a homeowner for a single person, 280 grand. Uh, and for a non-homeowner, it's 504 grand. But if the money is in superannuation, it's not taken into account. So if you claim a TPD benefit lump sum and the money is still in super, or to the extent to which it's in super, it doesn't count towards the assets test, right? So there are ways of making a TPD claim, making an income protection claim, and claiming Centrelink benefits, including the healthcare card, <coughs> There are ways of doing a combination of the law. <coughs> Pardon me. All right. So again, it's important to sort of map the pathway here for folk. Right. So that's that. Now there's a whole lot more 
about Centrelink, in, about Centrelink benefits and eligibility and all that sort of stuff and how you claim and how you appeal and all that stuff and the NDIS, but that'll be in the next session we run. Hey, Peter. <laughs> exactly right. Yes, there's, there's a lot to get to. So um, an hour is probably not long enough to get to all the stuff we need to, but um, I'm sure we can book in some extra sessions down the road. Um, no worries. Right. So look, in the meantime, if you've got any questions, um, I'm, ha I'm happy to answer anything, anytime. You got the number there or send, drop me an email or whatever and <clears throat> I'll answer anything you've got, any questions you've got. It doesn't cost you anything for me to do that. I'm happy to help you. All right. I'm done, I think. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, John. That was um, very informative. And um, I hope that we got to most people's questions. I think we did. We've got a couple there that um, I can ask of John after this session and, and we'll get you those answers. So um, just to finish off, I want to run you through a few of um, MS Plus's service, services. And um, just to let everyone know that we have changed our name to MS Plus, um, if you weren't aware. So um, all our services are still the same. So as you can see there, we offer um, things like allied health, so NDIS, My Age Care. Um, we offer physiotherapy, ex exercise physiologists, um, occupational therapists. Um, we uh, have employment support, residential care, we have wellbeing and peer support. And, and peer support is, uh, um, that's a great service and um, uh, would really recommend using that if you don't already. Um, and we have a uh, number of uh, other services as well. So please do look into those if, if you are looking for some support. Uh, we also have a number of services, uh, sorry, resources. Uh, we have our webinar library, which is um, under our resource hub and on our new website. Um, you can find our podcast there as well, um, any pu publications and articles also. Um, and we have our In Touch e-newsletter that goes out monthly. Um, we also do online uh, online live events um, on Facebook Live, so please do follow us on Facebook and other social media sites as well. So if you do want to contact us for more, if you um, are looking for some extra support or you have any sort of questions, um, please do contact us at MS Plus Connect on 1800-342-138 or, or email us at msconnect at ms.org.au and our MS Plus connectors are amazing and they will be able to help you with any queries or questions you have. Can, so, can, I, just, can I just reiterate that? I've, mm -hmm. I've dealt with the MS Society now, a lot of disability groups for 25 years now, and I know you, you probably don't think, you, you think you've lucked out by getting MS, and but uh, I can tell you, you've lucked in with the organisation that is associated with it because the MS Society is is really good. They are incredibly helpful, incredibly supportive. So use their services. I'd encourage you to do it. Sorry, that's my bit. <laughs> that Great, was unscripted. Thank you, John. Better. <laughs> that was absolutely unscripted. So thank you for that. And um, thank you so much for presenting today. Yeah, a, a great and very informative pre uh, presentation. I hope that uh, John got to all the questions that you may have had and certainly covered a lot of stuff there. So. Thank you, John, and thank you everyone for attending today. And please do stick around afterwards to just go out a short survey. That, that would be very helpful. So thank you all and, and have a great day. See you later. Bye-bye.